I'm Rory Smith, a broadcaster and interviewer. Everyone has a story of challenges and triumphs throughout life, and there's lessons to be learned from everyone's experience. That is why I'm asking each person I meet, what's your story? I want you to meet Sergeant Michael Crumrine from Texas. He's many things. He's a sergeant, he's a son, he's a brother, he's a husband, he's a dad. And he also happens to be gay. He grew up in a time in Texas when it was illegal to have same-sex relationships. He later married a woman who publicly outed him. Now, after many years of struggles and challenges, he's been true to who he really is and proven that your sexuality does not define you or limit you. Here is Mike's story. As you were brought up in quite a conservative family, you were the youngest of eight, you were close to your parents. What was your family's view of gay people? Well, my family families view of gay people were uh, they were wrong, they were criminal, they were crazy, they um, were disgusting, they were abominations. Uh, these were all terms that were said of individuals who were gay back then. And, and, and realized when I was growing up, all, all the way up until 2003, it was illegal in the state of Texas to have relations with somebody of the same sex. It, it, it was a criminal offense uh, as well. So, you know, you had, you had all, the, all the things that are supposed to guide you, right? The institutions of the church, of parenting, of school, because I went to parochial school my entire life from kindergarten all the way through high school. So you had that influence of the Catholic faith throughout all of my schooling and then even the government was telling me this was absolutely wrong horrendous terrible um so on and on and on so not only did you have the thought process of i'm gonna lose my soul um but you're also having the thought process of this is criminal. But the biggest thing, the, the biggest barrier overall out of everything was the sense that your family and friends would disown you. Um, that by far was the biggest fear factor or barrier in place. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if all of these things were telling you how wrong it was, did you believe that it was wrong? I did. Um, I believed it was it was it was a sin, and so it was a constant battle. Um, man, it was the part I didn't have then that I have now was when it came to being with somebody. It was. I am um, it was only for a sexual reason or it was only for uh, issues of the flesh when I was with somebody but that's not who I truly am um, it wasn't until I got older and, and actually my very first long-term boyfriend that I started to understand that I could be myself and be committed um, and have a lifelong relationship with somebody. Because up until that time, I never thought that was a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to have a family. I wanted to have a marriage. I wanted to have children. And because I had no frame of reference in the queer community of what that would be like, it was, it was this process of, okay, if I'm with a man, it's only for sex. And then uh, all these other factors, well, then I could just, I'll be with the woman and, and, and it'll all work out, right? In those departments that you're employed in, how difficult was it for you to be fully yourself, knowing at the back of your mind that you were gay? You couldn't be. I had to live a double life. I had to live a completely double life. Double life. Uh, I, I couldn't 
can be myself in any in any true sense of the word. Um, because yes, I would have been fired. And, and the departments that I had worked for were were not departments that were protected by civil service. So when I worked for the towns that I worked for, they were at will, which meant I could be fired for any reason. I, they didn't have to show cause to fire me. Mm -hmm. uh, so naturally, yeah, if my sexuality had come out, um, by all means, I could have been fired. Um, I worried were you about that. Insanely. Um, yeah, I was incredibly closeted, um, very, very discreet, very, 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 very discreet, mm -hmm. um, which was a challenge because so before I became a police officer, when I was so the age of being able to drink in Texas, I was one of these lucky guys that um, when I turned 18, it was legal to drink, and then they moved it, and then they, they moved it to 20, and then eventually to 21. And so I was able with just how when I was born, everything else to hit every one of those. So I've been able to legally drink uh, and go to bars and stuff like that since I was, I was 18, 19 years old. Um, and I wasn't a police officer then because you had to be 21 to be a police officer. So when I would go to gay bars back then, it was still something that was very, um, it, 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 man, it, it, you, you, you had to be very cautious about who you saw or didn't see or whatever. And that those were the only places you could go to meet other gay people. Right. I mean, we're talking in the late you know, 80s and 90s, in, in the early 90s or around that time. In those gay bars at that time, did you feel fully relieved or did it still feel a little bit wrong? I wasn't feeling a little bit wrong, but I was always looking over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. So there was a point in time after high school well, when I had one of the jobs that I had, and it wasn't in law enforcement because I didn't become a cop until I was 21. Um, so I was I was starting to feel myself. I was starting to explore a little bit more. I was trying to figure things out. And it ended up that, that, that a guy that I had met that uh, at a bar, um, he chose uh, to tell, he knew some people where I went to school with, um and he chose to tell them that that he saw me at a bar and certain things happen after that um and so i i went to another establishment months later um to meet some of the friends that i went to high school with and hang out and have a few drinks and you know where, where are we we graduated out of high school so we were all of legal age um and and a girl that I had gone to school with apparently knew this guy. This guy had said something to her. And in front of all of my friends, she challenges me about being gay. Um, because she said she heard that this guy saw me in a bar and on and on and on. Um, and it scared the hell out of me. Um, I didn't know how to respond to that. And of course, I denied it. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, no, no. Part of that... Um, I realized that if this information ever became public about me, number one, it wasn't, I was not ready to tell that account and nobody should out somebody else. Nobody should force somebody else to, to tell when they're not ready to tell. I was nowhere near ready to tell. And I got thrown into this arena. Mm -hmm. um, and I immediately denied, denied, denied because I was very fearful of what that was going to do to my family to my friends, to everybody else. And so being a 20 year old, 19, 20 year old, or however that was at that point, there was no way I could have, I, I, I didn't have any tools to deal with that. Mm. What was I gonna do? Where was I gonna go? Um, I was still living at home with mom and dad. I, I didn't have the financial resources to be out on my own. So I could, I could totally relate to that with, with youth now and why in, in the United States, you know, up to 40%, some would say up to 50% in Southern states of um, uh, homeless youth are identifying as part of the queer spectrum because they've been disowned by the family. I, I, I experienced that and I ran back in the closet 
padlocked the door, put a chain around it, sealed it, because there's no way I could deal with that at, the, at that time in my life. Um, and I was able to tamp it down. So, so, yeah, at that point, I stopped going to bars. I stopped exploring that. I ran back underground, for lack of better terminology, um, because I wasn't ready to face those consequences of what that was going to, to entail. Yeah. And and this sort of lockdown that you put yourself in continued right up until, I mean, it was 1990 when you married your now ex-wife. And yeah. even before you got engaged, you said to her that you had relationships with men in the past, you have feelings for other men. Why did it go as far as marriage? So that's a good question. Why did it go as far as marriage? Um, I actually wanted to break off the engagement because I was conflicted and realized I already had all of these major doubts. Um, but she convinced me that uh, our love um, would get us through everything. I loved my ex-wife dearly. When we got married, I loved her completely. I loved her totally. I loved her without any hesitation. She was somebody that I truly, truly fell in love with. Um, and, and from the moment we started dating uh, up until marriage, I was, uh, you know, until the latter part of my marriage, I was completely and totally faithful to her. There was nobody else. There was nobody else that, that uh, was in my life besides her. Um, and our marriage did not end because of my sexuality. It was a factor, but my, my marriage ended because of issues that her and I had um, that, that a lot of other couples ended up going through. Did you resent the feelings that you had towards men? I did. I, I mean, those were, um, I, I was struggling with, those aren't, those aren't proper. I'm married, I should be with my wife, I should get, dedicate that, I should not have these other feelings. Yeah, it was a constant battle back and forth with regards to that. Uh, um, and it just, it just eventually got to a point where my true self came through and, and because my marriage was, was faltering, um, it kind of forced me to, didn't force me, it allowed me to explore who I truly was. Um, and so, and so that's how I ended up going. And, you know, I, I get asked this question as well when I share my coming out story and people say, why not just come out? It's very black and white. Why wasn't it black and white for you? It's not. It is complicated. It is not just this easy thing. Let me set the stage for you. This is 1990. 1990. 95 when we eventually divorced. Um, San Antonio, Texas. One of the most conservative city or conservative states in the United States. There is absolutely no protections, no guarantees for anybody concerning their sexual orientation. You had the stuff that was happening to Matthew Shepard was going on in the in in, in the nineties, uh, in in the mid to late nineties with Matthew, uh, where people were still picking and preying on individuals, and it was okay. It was sanctioned to pick out and harm people that were gay. It was okay. Um, I came from an incredibly conservative family that was was staunchly Catholic. Also, very much military. Understand where the military was at that point, right? Everybody is wrapped up in the mystique of what it is to be a Texan. Um, strong, silent, cowboy, manly. What does manly mean? I don't know. Well, let's look to John Wayne, because let's say that he's the most manly person in the world. Let's all jump around him, you know, not realizing he's playing a character. That's not who he really is. But you have all of that going on, right? Um, at that at that point in time, you were going to be disowned by family 
by friends, by society, if you were queer. And the other thing is the only examples you had that people showed were the most, the people that had so much courage, and I love them for this, and I, I'm so impressed by the people that came before me who had the courage to be them our authentic selves and be out there and be in somebody's face. But that's the examples that you were shown. You weren't shown this example. You weren't shown the example of the conservative individual who wants to work in public safety and give back to society that is gay. That's what I grew up in. I mean, I worked with people in law enforcement that used to tell me when they were kids how they would run out and they would find places where gay individuals hung out and they would jump out of their trucks and beat their ass. This is what I, this is, this is, this is Texas. This is what I'm dealing with. Look at the horrendous thing that happened to Matthew Shepard in Wyoming, being taken out, taken on the streets, beat. Look at the stuff Anita Bryant was doing at that time, who herself had a gay son. But all you were seeing was her constantly coming out, being able, saying it is okay to target a group of people and harm them physically and destroy anything and everything about them. That was sanctioned by government. That was sanctioned by society. It's what people were saying at that point was the right thing to do. And I'm going to come out in all of that. And I, I have a job. I have a career at this point. I mean, my, my, do my, my, my daughter was born in 1993. You know, I had responsibilities that weren't just about me, that were about others. It's not that simple. It's not just turning a switch because people are looking through that through the lens of today. They're not looking at it as where it was in the 90s, in the 80s. Heck, let's go all the way back to Stonewall. You know, let's go back to 1969. Let's go back even before there and see how people who had the courage to come forward, God, they are amazing. God, those people are heroes. They are, they, they are some of the most phenomenal individuals that are out there. Those are the people that we should be giving medals to and awards to because they stood up and they said, this is me. I'm sorry. At that point in my life, I didn't have that courage. Mm -hmm. I just didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just the way life was at that point. I didn't have that strength. And at that time as well, you know, I believe that there's a big difference between knowing that you're gay and accepting that you're gay. When was it that you accepted that you were gay? So, in, in um, me accepting me being gay happened at the end of uh, my marriage, and um, it happened with my first boyfriend. His love of me was what. I needed to, to understand myself and start the journey of where I'm at today and, and understanding my self-worth and in understanding um, who I am as a person and being okay with that. Mm -hmm. He kind of opened that, that door and started that road. So. Mm -hmm. How did you tell your parents that you were gay? So um, I had sat down with my mom and dad. Um, I had a brother who was kind of pressuring me um, because of my relationship with, with my boyfriend, because uh, I wasn't telling people he was my boyfriend. I was just telling him he's a friend of mine. Um, and when that happened, and uh, I, I sat them down, and I had the, that conversation. And it was a challenge, but I, you know, my hat's off to my, my mom and dad. Uh, my mother is now deceased, God rest her soul. Uh, my father will be 94 this year. Um, it was a journey for them. And, and you know, my mother went through the thing that I think a lot of moms go through of what did I do wrong that caused this, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's people think 
being gay is like some disease, right? Like, well, if I just would have sanitized things better, they wouldn't have got the gay judge. It doesn't work like that. So, but parents oftentimes blame themselves for for thinking that they did something wrong, and she did absolutely nothing wrong. Um, what was their immediate yeah. response when you came out to them? Um, th- the immediate response uh, when they came when I came out to them was, you know what, we we love you. You're our son. We don't fully understand everything, um, but but we love you, um, and and we just want to see that you're happy. So uh, they, they actually showed that in a couple of different ways um, that were very, very telling uh, because I introduced them and let them know that the boyfriend, the friend that I had was actually my boyfriend. Um, and I was divorced from my wife at that point. And they were far more accepting than the rest of some of my family. Uh, I had a particular sister and her husband that that Christmas, uh, my parents had asked for my boyfriend and I to come to the Christmas. And a sister of mine had walked in with her husband and family, saw that he was there, uh, dropped the Christmas gifts, turned around and walked out. Um, And then called my father and berated him for why uh, he would allow um, me and my boyfriend to be there, or my boyfriend to be there, knowing how they felt about things. And, And my father stepped up and said, you know what? Um, this is our house. This is my house. And I am going to have whoever we want at our house. And if you don't get to tell me who I get to have at my house or who I don't get to have at my house, you don't have that right, just as I don't have that right to tell you. And if you choose not to be here because somebody's here you don't want, that's you. That's that's not me. Um, We're going to have who we want at our house. And we want it Mike and and my boyfriend at the time, Paul, um, to be there. So um, they were actually great. And and subsequently, when I got, when my husband and I got married in 2017, um, my mother had already passed, but my father actually walked me down the aisle. Um, Is (laughs) at 92 years old. So um, he, he thinks of my husband as his son. Uh, the rest of the family has finally come around. But um... there was a time that was more challenging than those times. This was in 1995. So you, you divorced your wife in 1995, your ex-wife in 1995. Then in 1997, you were having a custody trial. This was with your daughter. And your now ex-wife and her then husband were telling you that if you didn't give up the rights for custody of your daughter, that they would out you publicly, which they did. How did they do that? So when we went through the custody battle um, and, and um, we had, I had asked my attorney because I knew of this threat, they had threatened to do this several times. Um, to to have a gag, what we call a gag order put in place. And the judge admonished both of them at the end of the first day and said, what happened in this courtroom should not be discussed outside this courtroom. You understand that. This is a private setting. So he, he gave them an order not to speak. Um, they ran to a local news station in San Antonio uh, that night and ended up running a story about a gay police officer fighting for custody of his child in a bitter custody battle. Do you, um, and that's how the extended family found out about me. That's how the people I worked with found out about me. How worried were you to go back to work after that? I was really concerned because I didn't know. I didn't know what else was going to happen. I had subsequently had a meeting um, with some of my coworkers and my immediate boss um, and let them know kind of how long this has gone on and, and uh, how long. all of the backstory on all of this. Um, uh, yeah, I was worried and um, I didn't know what was going to happen, but 
I had assurances from my immediate boss and, and some other people uh, on the shift that, that this wasn't going to affect anything, that they still respected and, and admired me. And um, there was people I thought that were going to be the most problematic ended up being my staunchest supporters and friends. Uh, and one of one of these people um, was a colleague and friend who called you and asked you for a coffee. Tell me the story. So um, at the time in our police cars, we had what we called, they were, the, they were in-car computers. We, we called them MDTs at the time, mobile data terminals. And so we could send messages back and forth with each other and we could send messages. He worked for the San Antonio Police Department. I worked for a small town. That was a suburb of San Antonio. And we, we backed each other up on calls and stuff. So he sends me this message and said, hey, can I meet you for coffee? We need to talk. I was like, oh, crap. Because um, this guy was like ultra right wing. He had said to me several times how he didn't believe women should be in the military, that gays shouldn't be in the military or in law enforcement. Um, he just had these thoughts and feelings. And I'm just like, ah, oh, man, this isn't going to be good. But I knew I had to go face the music. Um, so we met at this coffee shop, and and I'm about to walk in, and he, he's, he's kind of waiting there, and he goes, hang on a minute. And I'm like, crap here it's gonna come man we're not even gonna get inside the door and he's gonna blow me up um and i'm like dreading this phone call and dre i mean dreading this this conversation and he says mike i just gotta tell you i was wrong and i i was taken aback and i'm like what what do you mean i, I don't understand and he goes i had always believed that people that are gay should not be in law enforcement. I had this thought or process of, uh, or thought of what somebody is who's gay, who they are, and I never thought that they should be in law enforcement. I never thought they should be in the military or anything else until I met you. Um, because of you, knowing you, knowing how you conduct yourself, knowing how you are as a police officer, because of that, it forced me to rethink the way that I think. It forces me to be, to think differently. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm like, like, wow. Um, and there's, there's this thing that we say in law enforcement, some of us, not everybody, but it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a sign of respect when you respect somebody else. And he said, you know, Mike, I just want you to know, um, I'll forever be proud to walk through a door with you. And so what that means, you know, when we go and we do the job we do, every door we walk through, we don't know if that's the last one because we don't know what's on the other side of that door um, as a cop. You don't know if somebody's there to harm you. You don't know if there's, you know, something bad. You don't know. You don't know what's on the other side of that door. And for another officer to tell you something like that means – um, I respect you so much as a police officer that that any any door that we happen to walk through, I feel confident that that you're going to do your job and you're going to have my back and you're going to protect me. And that, like even I'm telling the story now, I'm getting goosebumps just going back and reliving it. That was so empowering to me because. All the things that I had talked about earlier, Rory, in regards to why I didn't come out and the fears I had and all of that were because I had a mindset, it had been programmed into me that being gay was less than, less than somebody else. I'm not as good as whatever, a police officer, a military officer, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. I'm not as good as because I'm gay. Um, and for him to say that it started me changing the way that I thought and said, if somebody else can see that I am just as good, 
then then it helps me understand that I am. And now I'm in a point in my life because of the things that I've done, the things I've accomplished, the 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 people I've been around. I I know that I am as good. As a matter of fact, and I'm not saying this in a braggadocious way. Not only am, am I as good, I'm probably better than most um, in the job that I do. And I'm okay with that. But I couldn't get to that level of understanding and that level of contentment as a gay man without going through what I had to go through. And then getting that validation back from him. And I thought that was really big on him to be able to acknowledge and say I was wrong. Because the stereotypes that I had been told what society had programmed me to believe was was false mm. because every one of us that are here are just humans it doesn't matter who i love it doesn't matter how i present i'm human and and probably because of some of those things i may be better than some in certain areas because I've experienced this or because I have that insight. Um, and that is part of the diversity that makes this world such a phenomenal place. And it's something that needs to be celebrated, not shunned. Mm. And how did after that, did you begin to live a more fulfilling life? Pretty pretty soon you know i mean i um i wanted to live that life in in san antonio because that was my hometown that's where everybody was uh, but, but san antonio wasn't ready um the police departments down there weren't ready they weren't they weren't ready to embrace a career officer some of the departments i applied to uh, when they found out that i was gay no nope, sorry so things had not worked out, and I was going to give up law enforcement because I thought now that I'd been out, and now that all this had been out about me, now that all this information had been put out, that that door was going to be closed. And Austin was progressive enough to say, screw that. We don't care if you're gay. We don't care about any of that. If you can work, do a job as a cop, we want you as a cop. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so a much different environment than what I was experiencing in San Antonio. How have you found the confidence to now not hide it anymore? So the confidence, when I went to Austin, I said, look, this information is there. Austin knew about it. Austin knew about all this being in the press. They knew about all that stuff. They had to know all that stuff because, as I said, they, they asked those questions. They had to know all that. So I said when I went to Austin, I wasn't going to wear my sexuality on my sleeve. I wasn't going to walk up to everybody and go, hey, I'm Mike Kramer and I'm gay. Who does that? Do you walk up, you know, somebody walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm Bob Smith, I'm straight. No, I wasn't going to do it. But I was also never going to deny it. You know, I'm, I'm president of, of the Lesbian and Gay Peace Officers Association which is the first and only in the state of Texas that, that I was I was not the founding, I was one of the founding members. It was not my idea. It was other brilliant, brilliant individuals. I just I, I was just one of the people that helped form it and I'm currently the president now. So so that's it because being gay is not all about that's not every aspect of me. You know, um I, I'm I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a husband, you know, I'm a cop. I'm I like to think I'm a pretty darn good cop. I've had some pretty, you know, uh, high profile cases I've worked in my career. I've done some really good things in law enforcement. I've had that, that opportunity. Um, I'm a great friend. Um, I, I like to, you know, there's, there's tons of other things that I do. I'm just gay. It, mm. it doesn't, it's not everything that there is to be about. With your daughter, did you have to come out to your daughter? Mm hmm. I did. I did. Um, so my daughter was probably around eight, um, and I came out to her. And you know, in her early stages, she was eight. She, you know, she she was trying to understand and wrap her mind around it. 
subsequently, uh, when my daughter was was 13, we got custody of her. Uh, I got custody of her for my ex-wife. Um, and she's lived with us, my husband and I, ever since. So um, my daughter is amazing. She tells everybody she has two gay dads. Uh, she's incredibly supportive, um, very supportive of me, very supportive of, of, my, of our, you know, her, her, her other father, uh, you know, my husband, um, she's phenomenal and loves me and my husband dearly and, and, and completely for who we are. And something that we, because we had a, a short telephone call last week and setting up this interview. And during that, we talked briefly about seeking res- seeking acceptance from people and seeking respect from people and the difference between those and that was really powerful what you told me what is the difference between those so this this i was actually told by uh judy shepherd matthew shepherd's mother who she Matt, judy and, and dennis are the most phenomenal individuals but judy was speaking last year at their their conference and judy had said um and, and she says i don't recall she attributed this to somebody else but 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 um i don't recall the name that she attributed it to so i apologize for that but what she had said is you know when we ask as gay individuals or as trans individuals or anybody as part of the queer community uh for acceptance we're, we're actually asking we're, 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 we're giving somebody control over us because when we ask somebody to accept us, we're asking, we're, we're granting them some amount of power over us because you can't give acceptance. That, that's something you're given, right? I'm given acceptance means that you have to give me something. Um, and her point was, and I feel the same way, I, I don't want your acceptance. I, I That's not what I want. But I damn sure am going to demand your respect. There's a difference with that. I don't need you to give me anything. Because that's one of the things that a lot of people will say is, well, you want me to, to accept you. I can't because of X, Y, Z, because of this religion or that religion or because of this, because of that, or because of my personal beliefs. So I can never give you acceptance. I don't need your acceptance. I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't want anything from you other than I will demand that you're going to respect me for who I am. I'm, I'm a cop. I'm, I'm, I'm the big gay cop from Texas. I tell people that all the time. You know, I stand six foot one. I'm 240 pounds uh, trying to get down to 220 or less. Um, I, I have a big booming voice. I'm not a small, little, small guy by any stretch. Um, but I'm the big gay cop from Texas. And, and you're going to respect me. I've come to that re- realization. Um, you can't deny me the same rights and privileges that you have. Because I am no different. If you will respect somebody for who they are, doesn't mean you have to agree with them on everything. But you have to grant them the same rights and privileges that you grant to anybody else and you have to treat them the same as anybody else. If you were to do that, you would never take anybody's dignity away mm-hmm. at all. And that's why I think that's important and an important lesson for people to learn. Mm-hmm. I know that we, towards the start of our conversation, when you were talking about your teenage years and growing up in your early twenties, that you believed that if you were to ever come out as gay, that it would limit you in life, limit your relationships, limit you in your career. You now have so many roles. Does being gay affect the ability for you to do any of those roles? Absolutely not. Um, I, I think being true to yourself, allows you to do those roles because you're more authentic as a person. My, my biggest fear is that, you know, when we started this conversation where we talked about how um, there was, you know, 
the church said being gay was wrong. Government said being gay was wrong. The criminal justice system said being gay was an arrestable offense if you, you know, if you engage in 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 in, in sex with somebody of the same um, the same sex as you. Um, but all of those barriers that were there, the one that was the most um, troubling for me, the one that was the, the the biggest hurdle to overcome, was the fear of being disowned, the fear of not being able to have that love of a, of a husband, the fear of not being able to have the love of a child because I wouldn't have a family, the love for my parents, the love from my coworkers, the love from my family. And so being authentic, being my true self, allows me to be that, that much better at all of those, and all of those aspects, because everything that I'm doing now um, it's genuine. It doesn't come from behind a curtain of uh, anonymity. It, it comes from this is who I am. Um, and I don't approach everything as I'm, you know, I'm a gay son, I'm a gay coworker, I'm gay. I'm all of those things. I just happen to be gay. But because I can say that now, because I can accept that now, and because I won't turn away from that and I will correct people, um, when they denigrate me for that, mm -hmm. um, allows me to be that much more genuine and authentic in all the other roles that I have in my life. Being able to be true to yourself is important. And I think the other thing that I wanted to say is that to whoever else is watching this, um, I know there may be um, a gay child somebody who's question, who's thinking, maybe questioning, doesn't, or maybe trans, or maybe, you know, pan, um, sexual, whichever, and they're trying to come up with their authentic self and they're struggling with all of that. I, I know it takes a tremendous amount of courage to come forward. You should be commended for that when you do. When you're your authentic self, when you can be yourself, um, that is so powerful, um, and, and you should be commended for that. But I also want you to know there are more people in the world like me that are here to protect you, that are here to make sure you can be happy, that are here to stand up for you and say, you can't do this to this person. You can't treat them wrong. You can't fail to respect them. You cannot take that person's dignity away. It's not right. And we're not going to allow you to do that. Um, that's what's important. There's plenty of us that are out there now. Um, we've always been there. It was a journey for me to get to that point. And you'll find uh, allies in some of the most unexpected areas. Um, so if you can find the courage to be yourself, I encourage you to do so. And I'll finish on this. This is uh, an Instagram post, actually, from your own account from 2018. This is when you wished your dad a happy 92nd birthday to the person who taught me the importance of family and to stand up and speak out for those who can't. I hope I can be half the man you've become. Well, on behalf of those who can't speak out today, thank you, Michael. Thanks, sure. I appreciate it. That, uh, that brought a tear to my eye, but he is an amazing man that I learned a lot from, and, and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come chat.